Good morning. I'll take more water breaks this sermon because uh, I don't make my living by speaking and my voice is just not in shape. So you'll have to excuse me when I take some water at different points today. Uh, but like Cato said, I'm Cam Drapes. Uh, my wife and I, we run the kids ministry here at Church of the Gates. Uh, if you're parents of littles, we have probably met you. If we haven't, we'd love to. Um, and if you're not parents of littles, I'm sorry that I probably haven't seen you. I'm basically from like the check-in desk that way. I don't even know the sanctuary exists most days. So that's all right. But I am grateful that you are all here. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, God, I'm so grateful for the time that you've given us this morning to gather in the beginning of winter and potentially treacherous roads. God, I thank you that we can be here as your local body. Lord, I thank you for, for your son and what he has done for us uh, to give us the desire and the ability to be here. Uh, Lord, I just ask that today as we, as we move through the message that you would give me wisdom uh, to just stick to your word and teach your word. And I ask that, that through this, that we would all know the author of your word, which is you. God, I ask that you would grow our faith and our knowledge this morning uh, as we look at Ezekiel. In your son's name we pray, amen. Okay, imagine with me, God comes to you and he says, feel free to make a model of Missoula with like Legos, like bricks, like small Legos, which sounds like fun to most of us. Maybe some of us, I'm a big Lego guy. Uh, but then what I want you to do, once you've made this, this model, is to prophesy against it. Say some things that that Lego village would not like to hear, like you are stuck in idolatry, you're rebellious, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to destroy you. Or maybe you shave your head, and then you take all that hair, and you chop it up with a sword in front of everyone. Potentially, God comes to you and says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to lie on your left side, strap yourself down, and buckle up, because you're gonna be there for 390 days. And then you're not done, you're gonna roll over on your right side, and you're gonna be there on your right side for another 40 days. That sounds awesome. What about if God came to you and said, I want you to eat food cooked over poop? Mmm. No oven, no pizza oven, no stove top, just poop. Or don't mourn when your spouse dies. What about, some of your wives may actually appreciate this one, what about you cannot speak basically unless spoken to by me? For about six and a half years, seven years, Ezekiel was mute, he couldn't talk, unless God said, this is what the sovereign Lord says, go tell my people. No side conversations with his wife, no casual conversations, just this. These are some of the things that God had Ezekiel do as object lessons to the people of Israel that were with him. But I bet if you asked him, hey, was that worth it? He'd probably say, yeah, because he got FaceTime with God. All of that. None of that is something, that, I mean, maybe I would build the Legos. But then if I was in public prophesying against a Lego set, it might be kind of funny. So I'm going to talk a little bit about prophecy before we get into Ezekiel. There's an analogy that I've, I've picked up along the way that, that Old Testament prophecy was like looking at a mountain range in the distance. These, these, these men in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, what the Lord would tell them would be kind of like looking at this mountain range, right? And I think there's three different tiers there with really no idea how much distance is between those mountains and the next one behind them. That's kind of like what prophecy is like and kind of what reading prophecy is like. See, in the book of Ezekiel and some of these other prophets, it could be almost mid-paragraph where they're talking about something immediately that's going to happen, and then they switch gears to something that may even be future for us. That has helped me as I have read through the prophets. I hope that just helps you. 
Uh, another fun thing we get to do this morning is look at some of the fulfilled prophecies. These things weren't fake. A lot of th- times I think we think of like, ooh, prophecy, like what does the oracle say? I th- always think of the matrix. Or for those of you that are like Harry Potter fans, you know, you have to go into the thing and knock over all the prophecies and it's a giant mess. That's not what this was like. Prophecies in the Bible are prophecies that God gave to people to share with his people. So, real things, two of them we're gonna talk about today. The first one is a prophecy that has been fulfilled that Ezekiel spoke against the nation of Edom. And the second one is against the nation of Tyre, or the city of Tyre. So Edom, when we read in Ezekiel 25, verses 12 and 13, says, thus says the Lord, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended And taking vengeance on them, therefore, thus says the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. I will make it desolate from Taman even to Dedan. They shall fall by the sword. Some backstory on Edom. They were kind of like Israel's long lost brothers. Uh, They were were descendants of Ishmael. And when, when Israel came out of Egypt, They needed to go through the land of Edom to make it to the promised land. The king said no, let it go around. And then, strangely, when Babylon came in to conquer the nation of Judah, they ran, right? We we run, we flee from these people that that are attacking us. The Edomites would wait at the border, wait at the bridges, capture the Israelites, and take them to the Babylonians. They hated the Israelites. So God says, I will cut off from you man and beast. Well, today, the land of Edom is a desolate wasteland. There are no Edomites. They don't exist. They haven't for a couple thousand years. Herod the Great is the last known Edomite that we ever see in history. And as history goes, when Rome took Jerusalem and the temple fell in 70 AD, Edom ceased to exist. Ezekiel's prophecy about Edom has been fulfilled. The second one is Tyre, and we'll read Ezekiel 26, verses 12 through 14. They will plunder your riches. This is against the city of Tyre. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters And I will stop the music from your songs, and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. Well, the city of Tyre was sort of a twofer. They had a city on the coast, and then they had an island. It was was really well fortified. Wall all the way around the edge of the island, a couple of ports. They were a huge trade Trade people, they traded, they were, they were powerful. Well, what ended up happening, because that's not an island, that's a peninsula. So Nebuchadnezzar came in with Babylon, defeated coastal Tyre, turned it to rubble. About 200 years later, Alexander the Great shows up, and he takes the rubble from coastal Tyre, just like Ezekiel said, your stones, your timber, your soil, He takes all of that and he starts throwing it into the sea and makes his army a bridge out of the rubble of their other places. And they end up getting out to the island, conquering conquering the island, defeating it. Tyre today, a fishing village where they spread their nets on the rocks of what used to be historic Tyre. Another prophecy that we see in history has been fulfilled. And Tyre, while Ezekiel says it will never be rebuilt, clearly there are buildings there, but it's not a global power. It will never again be as powerful as it was in ancient times. So a little bit of book information about Ezekiel. The author is the namesake, Ezekiel. He identifies himself in the first three verses, and we don't know when the book was finished or penned or, you know, finally penned, but Ezekiel prophesied in the the country of Babylon for about 20 years, from 593 to 573 BC. And this is, this is important to know 
So if we remember, the nation of Israel was split, right? There's the northern kingdom, 10 tribes there. There's the southern kingdom, two tribes. Assyria took care of the northern ones like 100 years ago. They came in, they conquered them. You would think the nation of Judah would have learned something from their other brothers. They did not. So they are taken to Babylon. Ezekiel ends up there in the second deportation. So he goes with his king and some other folks uh, to Babylon. And he's actually there. He's a contemporary of Daniel. We all know the next book that's coming is Daniel. Uh, but Daniel, would have, he would have been a prophet in like the royal house, whereas Ezekiel would have been with the people of Judah, conquered still in Babylon. So that's a little bit of our setting. Uh, it's also important for us to know that the whole reason God's people are conquered and in captivity is a fulfillment of what God said he would do through Moses back in Deuteronomy. This is sort of Moses' last great sermon to the nation of Israel. And at the end of Deuteronomy in chapter 28, verses 63 and 64, Moses says, And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. So Moses is switching gears. He's just got done telling them, if you obey God's law, if you obey his commandments, if you do these things, you will be blessed. But if you don't, God says through Moses, I will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you, and you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. So that's where we find ourselves. The nation of Israel has fallen into idolatry. The smaller nation of Judah has fallen into idolatry. They've broken God's law. They've broken God's covenant. And God is doing to them as he said he would. But the purpose of Ezekiel is actually to give hope. Hope of a future restoration. So the structure of Ezekiel the first three chapters, it's basically this vision that Ezekiel gets of God's throne and glory and the call of Ezekiel to be a prophet. We have the next few chapters, about 20 of them, 4 through 24, they cover judgments against Judah. But the world doesn't escape from this. So, next seven chapters, 25 through 32, judgments on Gentile nations. But the last 15 chapters are chapters of hope. Hope of future restoration, God's people will not be conquered and in captivity forever. So as we get into Ezekiel, I want to cover three things that bring hope. Three reasons for hope we can see of Ezekiel. We have God's character, God's judgment, and God's promise. So if we start with God's character, it's important for us to know God is different from us. And we're actually going to take a few minutes. I'm going to read this vision that Ezekiel has of God's throne, throne chariot, and his glory. It's basically the entire chapter one. You can either follow along or I'd encourage you, just listen and try to imagine what this vision is that Ezekiel saw. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness all around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on the four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, <laughs> The four had the face of an ox on the left side, 
And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the creatures, and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those who went... These went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out, one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human, pres a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around it. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. I bet if I pulled all of you, we would all have something different that we just envisioned of what that looked like. That is a strange vision. And I don't want to get caught up in what the faces mean and the wheels and the eyes and the wings and all of that. What's important for us is that God is different from us. I think oftentimes we picture God almost reverse engineered from ourselves. Like, well, we're, we're like a fractured version, but we're made in his image. And God is different from us. I drive a pickup truck. God drives that, whatever that is. <laughs> we are different. So, two ways God's character brings hope, right? We just, we just envision a little bit of God's glory and some of his character, but two ways that God's character brings hope, his love. We all know this, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, God's love is different from us. His love is for the whole world. Somehow, God is able to love everyone. How many watched the game yesterday? A few people. How many hated the other side? A few people, I get that. We have a hard time loving the opposing, like, like the fans of an opposing team. 
much less the whole world. And I'm not, I'm not a big football guy, but I'm a big me guy. And I'm, I'm selfish, right? Like I think back on my marriage and, and I'm supposed to love my wife well, right? That means I lay down my life. But I, for a number of years in our marriage, I played this phone game, Clash of Clans, all the time. All the time, to the much chagrin of my wife. And, and there were times where it got to the point of like, babe, put it down. Come spend time with me. And my response was always, well, but I have to do this one thing, or, or the guys are counting on me to do this one. Guys I've never met are counting on me to do this one thing. And it's like, man, did I fail to love my wife in that moment, <laughs> those many moments. But God is different from us. He has no problem loving everyone. It's never a second guess. The second way that God's character will bring us hope is his mercy. If we look at Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, Luke said, well, Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. See, God has mercy for everyone. He is kind to everyone. It says right here, he's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. I am not. I don't want to be. My flesh wants to rise up when I see evil. I don't want to love them. But God loves. God is kind. I think of another personal story. You guys are getting a little bit of me here. So this week, I'm hanging out with my girls. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and we're, we're eating lunch. And, and they have the world's greatest dino nugs because dad made them. And we're hanging out, and I finish before my girls, and for whatever reason, they're taking forever. For those of you that have kids, it's impossible to keep them alive. They fight over sleep and food, which are two things kids need to live. And those are our biggest fights. So I finish way before them. Uh, but my kids, well, Finley... She grabs her plate, because I go to the couch. She grabs her plate, and she comes over and sets it on the couch, and I get up to do something, right? I get up, and I knock her plate off, and it flips over, and we have the Lord's Chick-fil-A sauce on the carpet now, and we have ketchup on the carpet, and chicken nuggets, and my first response is, Finley, why would you put that there? And she's, like, she's a feeler, and, and I could tell in the moment, like, whoop. Not good, Dad. And I, I came back to her and I was like, honey, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not really mad at you. It's no big deal. We'll clean it up. It's fine, right? All my daughter wanted was to come sit by her dad and eat her chicken nuggets. But I was not merciful in that situation. And Finley's not even my enemy. I love her. God has no problem being kind and merciful to everyone. So he is different, and we have great hope that he is different. I am grateful that I am not God, and that his mercy is not based on my mercy. God is also jealous for his name. What I mean by this is he values, the value of his name is important to him. Okay, the, the phrase, for the sake of his name, occurs 15 times in Ezekiel, and oftentimes it is well, it's in the midst of bringing judgment on Judah. It says, man, you guys rebelled. You're struggling with idolatry. I will bring my wrath against you, but I relented for the sake of my name among the nations. God values his name. He values how we represent him. See, there's this, there's this long list in Ezekiel chapter 8 of abominations. Ezekiel kind of gets popped up in this vision, taken to Jerusalem, and God takes him into the temple and the courts and the city. And there we find, well, the priests have drawn on the walls of the temple all of these 
well, their own gods, and they're worshiping things made of wood and stone, and, and they've defiled God's temple, and you go into the courts, and there's even more, and you go out into the streets, and God shows him that there are people worshiping the sun, and there are people worshiping uh, Tammuz, who's this, this goddess of the underworld, and no one is worshiping God. God's people are worshiping anything they can find but him. They are worshiping things that they have made. Two chapters later, we're still in this vision, we see God's presence leave the temple. And this is really sad, but also encouraging. See, the people of Israel, God's people, they valued Jerusalem. They valued the land that God promised them. They valued the temple. They valued these things that, well, we're God's people, so we can kind of do what we want. And they valued the promises, but they didn't value God. So you see God's presence leave the temple and head out of Jerusalem east. I should have put this on a map. Babylon is a really far ways away from Jerusalem, but it's to the east. See, God's temple, or God's presence leaves the temple, but heads to where he knows his people are. He heads to Babylon in that direction. This would have given great hope to the readers. Like, we're in captivity. This stinks. But God is with us, so we're going to be okay. On to God's judgment, a large portion of this book. Ezekiel is a very vivid writer, super vivid. There are, there are at least three chapters. There's chapter 16, 20, and 23 are, are, well, they're savage of how God describes Judah's rebellion, their idolatry, their doing anything to not worship him. And I'm actually going to read just a few verses of Ezekiel 16. And Ezekiel 16, we're going to go verse 23 through 31. Uh, this, is, this is in the middle of a text that talks about how Jerusalem and her abominations are like this baby who's bloody in a field and hasn't been washed, and her parents are the Canaanites and the Amorites. So it starts off on a rough foot. But we're going to read into this after this baby has grown up and God has given her everything, given her clothing and adornment and jewels, which we know in Jerusalem, God blessed the people as they worshiped him. So God says, and after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. This was something prostitutes did. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering, your, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whorings also with the trading land of Chaldea and even with this, you were not satisfied. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square. Yet, you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. Ouch. You were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. You ran to everyone around you wanting what they had giving yourself to them and not accepting anything from them. God and his view of idolatry is serious. He cares about our hearts. He cares about the disposition of our hearts. Church, let us not be a people that God says, how sick is your heart? But three ways God's judgment brings 
hope. Well, we see in Ezekiel there are a number of chapters of judgment on his people. See, God is judging them because they are not worshiping him. The state of their heart is sick. But, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, church, where we stand today, we are God's people. And we have hope because Jesus took all the wrath of God on the cross for us. When God, we, I've heard it said this way that God's wrath was like this massive lake held behind a dam. And in my sin, that dam broke and the, the waters were rushing towards me. And just before they got to me, Jesus stepped in and he took it all. He drank the entire cup of God's wrath. That's why on the cross he, said, or cross he says, it is finished. See, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, we can do whatever we want. No. No. Paul says in another party, well, we could party for Jesus, right? We can party for other reasons because we have so much hope. But Paul says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? See, we don't have the right to live how we want. Paul continues this by saying, you were crucified with Christ. You were buried with him so that you can be renewed in him, not to live how you want, but so that he can live through you to reach people for his kingdom. God is so good that he provided the only way that we would not have to suffer his wrath. The second way, judgment on the world. How do we have hope on judgment on the world? Well, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, and Peter's talking about the day of the Lord, the coming day of judgment for the world, those who are not in Jesus. But God is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach Repentance. See, we have hope because God is holding back the day, the final day, because he wishes that none would perish. God loves the world. His mercy is for the world. All we have to do is reach out, repent, and believe in Jesus. The third way we have hope in God's judgment is it's inevitable. It's coming. See, the people in Ezekiel's time didn't believe that. They said, there's a, a, at the end of one of those other vivid chapters, Ezekiel cries out to God in Ezekiel 20, verse 49, and he says, then I said, ah, Lord God, they are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? In one sense, yes, like the city of Jerusalem is not actually a physical woman doing these things. It's a parable. But these people didn't believe that God's judgment was coming. And we know through history that they were removed from their land. They were removed from their temple. They were removed from all of this. God's judgment came. His judgment is inevitable. But where do we stand and where do you stand? Do you stand beside Jesus so that he can take God's wrath for you? Or do you stand with the Gentile nations hoping you can do it on your own. I can assure you, you cannot. However, if you stand with those Gentile nations, if you stand with people that have not yet trusted in Jesus, here is the hope for you. It's not too late. Right? Peter writes that God is patient and he's holding back. His judgment is coming, but he's holding it back. And I wanna plead with you. Make today the day don't leave here without putting your faith in Jesus. This is real. And it's not too early. Don't put this off. All wrongs will receive justice. 
Paul talks that, that the wages of sin is death. And this is why I think this is so serious for us to consider. That death is not, well, we're just gonna grow old and die. That will happen to all of us unless Jesus comes back. That, this death that Paul is talking about, the wages of sin, is a permanent death. That you are permanently separated from the God of the universe, the God that loves you, the God who sent his son to save you and me. See, the only difference between me and you, if you're not a believer, is that Christ stands in the way of God's wrath on my life. Please consider that. So, the third way we have hope, the third way we have hope from the book of Ezekiel is God's promise. And this is so good. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27, it talks about a new covenant, right? Is the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, they've had a hard heart, refusing to worship God. But God says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So he's gonna gather all of his people back. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is good news. On this side of the cross, we know that Jesus has given us his spirit to dwell in us, to help us on this road of worshiping God and honoring him in all that we do. God is going to do the work. He's going to take out our stubbornness and give us his spirit. Hebrews 9, 13 through 15, the author writes, and he compares these two covenants, right? He compares the old covenant, the sacrificial system of, of sheep and cows and bulls to the new covenant of Jesus. And he says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, because Jesus offered his blood as payment for us, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. See, we have a permanent inheritance when we belong to Christ. Our inheritance is eternity with God. It doesn't get much better than that. Because of what Jesus did, Jesus stands between me and you and God the Father, the Holy One, mediating between us, where when we mess up, when we sin, and God's judgment is there, Jesus says, no, I got that. No, I got that. See, this new covenant is God's people are covered under the blood of Christ shed on the cross. And church, I wanna end with this. We don't have to wait for hope. See, right now we live in this already and not yet. We have already been saved from the consequences of our sin through Jesus. We can already know God, and yet we still struggle, right? We still struggle but there's coming a day when Jesus is making everything new. Our hope is in him. We will be made new. We will be glorified in the future, but we also have hope now. Our hope is in Jesus. So what does this mean? What does this mean for, for those who, who are fighting cancer? This means that Jesus is making all things new. There will be a day where you will not struggle with that anymore. You will have a glorified body. What does this mean for those who are in difficult marriage? 
God's love and his mercy are there for you in Jesus. He wants to wrap his arms around you and love you. What does this mean for those who have suffered injustice? Justice is coming. It will come. And what does this mean for, for anyone who has not yet chosen Christ? It's not too late. It's not too late. I want to urge you, consider a holy God who has provided his son to make a way to him. And for us who are the body of Christ, what does this mean? Sin is serious. It is serious. The same God that hated sin in the Old Testament is still the same God today. Sin is serious. We repent for our sins. We run to God. Knowing that he loves us, knowing that he's taking care of us. Let us not be a people whose heart is so sick. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Thank you for this time today to dive into your word, to know you just a little bit more. And Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the new covenant that we are covered under the blood of Christ and we praise you for that. Thank you for what you have done for us. God, help us to live lives that are repentant, that chase after you, that long for a deeper relationship and a deeper faith and a deeper knowledge of you. Set it in our hearts today, Lord, that we would continually pursue you and live our lives in a way that is holy and pleasing to you. In your son's name, amen.